Welcome back to the UQ School of Architecture Architectural Technology Knowledge Series. In this series of videos we will work through some of the key aspects of design for fire safety. In this video we will provide a quick overview of the performance of a building in a fire and identify key principles of good performance and the consequences when aspects of the interconnected fire safety strategy come unstuck. In this first case study, we will look at a fire that occurred in the building situated on 875 North Michigan Avenue, Chicago. Known as the John Hancock Center, it stands at 343 meters with 100 occupied levels. Being one of the taller buildings in the world, it presents a unique set of challenges in terms of occupant safety in a fire. It is a mixed-use building with office, condominiums and restaurant uses. We don't often consider the difficulties that extreme height poses to the safe evacuation of occupants. Escaping down a hundred flights of stairs as an able-bodied person would take many hours, meaning that the containment of a fire, the building's structural stability, and the performance of all systems becomes critical. In addition, we have the added complication being that this is a mixed-use building with a large number of residents. On November 21, 2015, these strategies and systems were put to the test when a fire broke out in a condominium on the 50th floor. Right now I want to tell you about an urgent situation here in the United States. Police telling CNN there is a fire in Chicago's John Hancock Tower. A fire looks to be about on the 50th floor. This, of course, is the iconic skyscraper located on Chicago's Michigan Avenue. The fire appears to be about halfway up the tower. On the ground floors, you have a lot of retail space. You have condos uh, and residential space uh, until you get to the very top where there's a restaurant and observatory. Joining me on the phone, our correspondent Ryan Young. He's just arrived on the scene. And we can see from these pictures, Ryan, you've got fire trucks, you've got uh, um, ambulances, and you have a fire in this building. What's the situation right now? But let me describe just the scene for you. Look, they were getting ready to have a parade here in Chicago today, and in fact, most of the roads are being blocked up for that. Um, had to make about a mile run to get here. You can see fire trucks and police personnel just about everywhere for about five to six blocks over. And, you know, the city blocks here are pretty huge. Um, right now, I would say more than 60 firefighters just on the ground. And if you look up at the building, you really don't see much. But, of course, you saw the flames from that video. Everyone's talking about it on social media, just in terms of the intense flames that was pouring from this building. And when you talk about the idea of what's here, there's a Best Buy downstairs, there's a restaurant like a Cheesecake Factory, there's all these tourists who are here in town, who obviously were nearby. A lot of people are taking pictures right now. I'm actually standing by one of the exits right now where there's at least three ambulances waiting here. The apartment that was on fire had one occupant in it, and that occupant got out safely. There was a total of five injuries with this fire, all minor. In this instance, only five people were slightly injured and the fire was put out in a reasonable period of time. The fire did not spread throughout the building and the building was not significantly damaged. Even despite the dramatic images, one can safely conclude that the fire design and ongoing fire, fire management strategies worked as intended and worked well. Compare this e outcome to an example closer to home. Melbourne is currently experiencing an apartment building boom with significant apartment construction occurring in the Docklands area of Melbourne. The La Crosse building, designed by well-known Melbourne architects Ellenberg Fraser, is a mixed-use but predominantly residential 23-storey tower. It is a traditional reinforced concrete frame with a lightweight window wall facade. On the evening of the 25th of November 2014, a fire started on a six-level balcony as a result of an unextinguished cigarette. The resulting fire can be seen by this eyewitness amateur video. This report on ABC 7.30 report expands on this and begins to look at some of the reasons behind this failure. 
When a cigarette was left on a balcony table in Melbourne's Docklands precinct last year, it took fewer than 15 minutes for 13 storeys to go up in flames. The problem was the cheap cladding that covered the entire apartment building. It didn't meet Australian standards and should never have been used. But since that fire, it's emerged that potentially thousands of buildings in Australia could be covered with the same material. Madeleine Morris reports. They came in and said, get out, get out, evacuate now. Everyone was piling down the staircase and then we got outside and looked up and you could see the flames just pouring out of the building. Those of us that have been around for 30 years or more have never seen a fire develop in this way. We never expected to see a high-rise fire, particularly one in a new building, that would spread so quickly uh, from the 8th floor to the 21st floor. When the La Crosse building in Melbourne's Docklands district caught fire last November, it exposed a sleeping danger in Australia's booming construction scene. Cheap cladding imported from China that is highly combustible and covering an unknown number of buildings in Australia. It endangers the public and increases the chances that someone's going to be killed or someone's going to be seriously injured and that's a concern for everybody. So this is the cladding that was used on the La Crosse building. The brand name is Aluka Best, but there are a number of different brands. On the outside, it's got aluminium, and on the inside, it's got a polyethylene or plastic fibre. This is the cladding that should be used. It's called Aluka Bond. Aluminium again on the outside, but on the inside, it's got a mineral fibre core. But to the naked eye, you would never know the difference. From the videos we can see that the fire spread up the building and damaged the vertical section from level 6 all the way up through to level 21. Fortunately there was no one injured in the blaze, however questions started almost immediately about the flammability of the cladding specified in the building and how it allowed the fire to spread so quickly up the building. In the first instance it was found that during a post-fire building survey the number of beds in apartments indicated that occupancy numbers exceeded the design load and occupancy certificate. There were questions about the rating of the composite aluminium cladding material used as well. The uncertainty was attributed to the lack of documented evidence of the material's actual performance and recommended usage. The fire engineer and building certified were found lacking in their duty of care and auditing processes. The use of non-complying cladding generated significant discussion in the apartment construction industry because similar cladding materials is used almost ubiquitously in these types of developments. The main issue seems to be that cheaper material substitutions that on the surface look the same in fact have very different flammability performance attributed to the composition of the core of the composite aluminium sheeting. The lack of care in the specification of substitute materials and poor auditing of decisions has led to this disarray. The consequences to the client, building owner and design team were significant. The architects were referred to the Victorian Architects Registration Board and the building and fire safety engineer were referred to building practitioners board for disciplinary action. The builder has been trying to find a cost-effective solution to the problem through the installation of sprinklers on balconies to manage the temporary occupation certificate. For the building owners it has created uncertainty and has devalued their asset. In January of 2017 the builder was ordered by the Victorian Buildings Appeal Board to replace the cladding at an estimated cost of $15 million. The issue has ramifications to similar projects Australia-wide. A student accommodation building in Mary Street was not given an occupation certificate due to questions raised of the flammability of the cladding specified. Although the certificate was eventually issued it impacted the client at the time as students who had signed leases on the accommodation needed to be rehoused in local hotels until the issue was resolved. This still does not lay the issue to rest as even though a certificate has been issued 
suspicions of the effectiveness of the fire safety design still remain. Looking at the Australian cladding fiasco, the question remains, who was responsible? In reality, the responsibility is shared, however, that still implicates the architects as being part of the problem. In making things better, we need to pay close attention to the detailed decisions we make and not simply focus on the look of things. We need to understand the performance of materials and pay attention to detail lest we become embroiled in controversy or even worse, the death of someone impacted by a poor design decision. In the next video, we will look at the impact of detail and simple strategies that mitigate the issues of the spread of fire through composite structural and cladding materials.